So today we're in Acts chapter 9, and this is kind of getting fun because this is where we get to begin to talk about the Apostle Paul before he was the Apostle Paul um, while he, when he was Saul. And uh, as many of you know, the Apostle Paul, who some consider the greatest apostle, um, certainly the greatest apostle to the Gentiles since that was who he was called to, uh, the, one of the greatest writers in the history of, you know, writers, uh, wrote most of the New Testament Bible. Many of his epistles um, are things that we think about often and phrases that we often repeat. And even if you listen to politicians in Washington making um, speeches, you'll, they all, everybody steals from Paul. You know, Good writers borrow from other writers. Great writers steal outright. And so uh, the Bible has so many wonderful, clever phrases that good writers even steal from all over the Bible, but especially from Paul because he was such a clear thinker and such a logical thinker um, is such a powerful guy intellectually that people take from him. Anyway, before he turned into this wonderful apostle and writer and um, great changer of Western civilization as we know it, before he became this wonderful, exalted person that we, we adore, he was a horrible person. And he was a religious man and he was a Pharisee. Um, but w- as we know from our study of Scripture, just because someone is re- religious... Uh, doesn't mean that they're not demonic, and he was evil, and he was hard-hearted, and he was terribly um, hateful towards Christians. And in the period that we begin um, our teaching today, he was vehemently after um, anyone, especially Jews, who believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Uh, we all know that he stood there when, um, in the Sanhedrin, Stephen was martyred. He looked on approvingly. We know that he led a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. We understand from history that he persecuted Christians all over Israel. And as we pick up the scene today, he's not even satisfied with that. He's actually breaking out of the border of Israel and going vehemently after Christians um, all over the ancient world. In this particular case, in what we would call Syria today. Uh, He's going to have, on his way to Syria, on his way to Damascus, this wonderful experience that uh, even if you don't know the history or the scriptures around it, I know you have heard the phrase, he's about to have his Damascus Road experience. And and that's one of those phrases that we use a lot in the church, and it's also one of those phrases people use in the world, uh, kind of equivalent to a come-to-Jesus moment. And that's what he's having. He's having a very violent come-to-Jesus moment, a Damascus Road experience experience. Uh, when we talk about a Damascus sort of experience, typically what we, what we are saying, even if we're not using it in a spiritual sense, it was a, it was a moment in time, it was a moment in our life um, when we were hit right upside the head with truth, or we saw something that we had never seen before. And, and this encounter was violent, and this encounter was vigorous, and this encounter was kind of good for us, even though it was quite fearful. And everything that we thought was right, at least in maybe one area of our life, going into this encounter, we found out immediately as we were hitting the nose with it that it was terribly wrong. And so uh, many of us have had uh, miniature versions of a Damascus Road experience or a come to Jesus or a come to truth moment from time to time in our life. We thought one thing about a relationship and the opposite was absolutely true. We thought one thing about how our life and the way it was going to go and the opposite was absolutely true. We thought we were doing well at work and then we got fired. Come to Jesus moment, right? And and so every once in a while uh, we have these and uh, I would say in the grand scheme of our relationship with God uh, we We have them many times, but there seems to be at least once or twice in our life that we have a big one. Um, Where we're going along in our way, and we think we're right, and we think everything is right, and we are so sure of ourselves, and we are so focused on what we're right about, and we come into a violent collision with God that is filled with grace, and of course is filled with love, but because it's also filled with truth, it can be quite awesome and fearful. And it reverses, and it, and it changes, and it turns everything around. And so Paul, uh, Saul at the time, had an encounter identical to that. And, and it is very significant. It is significant historically, obviously, because it was his transformational moment, which led him on to do and be all the things that I've already talked about. 
Uh, He was so influential in the formation of the Christian church in the ancient world, the writings of our scriptures, and where we are and who we are today. Um, This was the moment that 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 turnaround happened that created that. But it is also significant as a passage, I think, um, because it is an application and an illustration uh, to each of us about an encounter that we need to have, an encounter that we may be having that we need to interpret, Uh, An incremental account of our relationship with God over time that is very dramatic and instantaneous with Paul, but may be happening to us over time. And it's also a great reminder, and I don't think this is a small thing, it's a great reminder, and I think this is very important for those of us who are being pursued by God or praying for somebody we love to be pursued by God. It's a wonderful reminder that salvation, um, having a relationship with God, being transformed by his presence, whatever, whatever you want to say about it, having a conversion moment, whatever it might be, uh, our salvation is much more about the will of God than it is about the will of man. Uh, the Bible says that Jesus is the author of our faith and the perfecter of our faith. Uh, you hear me often say he's not just the author, therefore the authority of and the one who willfully desired our faith in him and our transformation in him. He's the sustainer of that faith, and he is the perfecter of that faith. And so it is much more about the will of God, our relationship with him, than it is our own will. Um, Obviously, we have a role to play. Obviously, we respond to the will of God. Uh, Obviously, we respond to his overtures. Um, But this scripture and so many others give us a lens to look at our own relationship with God and calls us to exalt more uh, what he has done to reach us than what we have done to respond to him. So in Acts chapter 9, it says this. It says, meanwhile, in the midst of the ancient church exploding, uh, there was the persecution in Jerusalem. Everyone fleed, and as, uh, as the early church fleed, they seemed to preach the gospel wherever they went. And and the ancient church was growing. The Christian believers were growing all over the ancient world. People like Philip were going out and doing the wonderful things um, that we read about him doing over the last few weeks. And so in the midst of all of this, um, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. In the midst of all of that, Saul is continuing to pursue them. It says here that he went to the high priest in Jerusalem and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus outside of his own country. So that if he found any there, when he went there, who belonged to the way, that is to say they are Christians, they belonged to the way, um, they called themselves the way because it was a way of life, it was a way of salvation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It was a way to follow God. They were called the way because their faith was less about temples and going to a certain place and more about um, discerning the spirit and the word of God and following him. Anyone, any who belonged to the way, this Jewish sect that became Christianity, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. I love the phrase here, and I think it's an, I don't love it, it's kind of a bad phrase, but it's an important phrase because I think it well um, illustrates uh, what was going on in in the heart of Saul. When it says right there in the first verse that Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, it gives us an indication that Luke, the writer, wanted us to understand, and I'm sure Paul helped fill fill in this information, um, that he wasn't being driven by simply human motive. Um, He was at a minimum being incited. He was being uh, satanically... um, inspired for lack of a better word he was being driven demonically uh, to persecute God's people Uh, his his mind and his emotions and his spirit that was filled with anything but the Holy Spirit um, were all working in concert even with his intellect to pursue um, those who love God now if we want at the same time to kind of create application for us as we read along, and I think that's very important, um, there may be things in our life that we are pursuing with great energy and great intensity, and we may not necessarily be demonically uh, infused with energy to do that, but we may be being incited or lied to or having our flesh or our emotions played by evil in our drive for something. Uh, 
Uh, he was being driven. Uh, he was very clear. He was very ambitious. Um, he was going really, really fast in one direction. And I, 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 have, I have an experience, and I'm not going to give it to you today, in my own testimony, where, where I was living my own way, and I was being incited, maybe even demonically infused, to do my own thing. It wasn't to persecute Christians. It was just to be, like, the most not Christian person ever. And, you know, wine, woman, and song, fraternity life in college, you can fill in the blanks. And I was, I mean, I didn't just pursue this lifestyle passively. I was, I was all about it, man. I was going to, you know, live it up, you know, because tomorrow we die kind of thing. And so uh, in his particular case, it was incredibly sinister. He was pursuing, he was persecuting the Christian church. Now, he was a, he was a smart man, incredibly intelligent uh, he was a Pharisee. He knew the scriptures. He probably had the scriptures well memorized. He understood the temple. He understood the law. He understood what the scripture said for the most part about the becoming of the Messiah. He did not understand it through the Christian lens, but he had a, he had a lot of demonic energy, a lot of sinister intelligence, a lot of great facts and information in God's word, a lot of political influence. He was allied to the chief priest, which gave him great power, and he was using all of that in one direction. And, and what I really want to emphasize, and I hope some of us that are the most stubborn will realize, is he knew he was right. You ever been there? Are you there this morning? You just know you're right. He just knew he was right, and no one could tell him he was wrong in what he was doing and what he was thought and the way he was carrying himself. When I was in Israel not too long ago, I had the opportunity to go to the border um, in Israel with Syria, and we were really, I mean, we were right up on the border. As a matter of fact, um, UN observers were standing right next to us. We were talking to them. And the UN observers had a compound down in Syria that we could see, but they had to abandon it because the violence had gotten so bad there with ISIS that they had come back into Israel um, to just monitor things. And we could actually, in the, in the far distance, hear gunshots. This is the closest I've been to something like that. Well, actually, that's not true. I was in Africa recently during a terrorist attack. So I have a very exciting and dangerous life, in case you wanted to know. But anyway, we stood in this one place right on the border um, of Syria, and our tour director said, and he may have just been saying this because, you know, he wanted to get us to get excited. He may have made it up. But he said, uh, the, the dirt that you're standing on, the ground where you are right now, um, we believe was very likely the ancient road from Jerusalem to Damascus that the apostle Paul would have been on um, when he had his Damascus road experience. It wouldn't have been here, it would have been down the road closer to Damascus, but this is the road. And what was astounding to me about that, and, and, and I can't help but you know, allow it to inform my reading of the scripture, is it was, it was a really long way from Jerusalem. It took a long time to get there in a bus. I can't imagine how long it took you know, uh, Saul to get there way back in the day, and he was even further down the road, and, and it just gave me a sense of, his hatred and his fear and his concern and how driven he was to do something about these Christians. I really do believe that he was, he was demonically incited to believe that he was doing a service for God um, and for the Messiah and for everything that was good and holy and righteous by persecuting Christians. He was, he was that sure and he was absolutely, um, he was that wrong. It says in verse 3, that as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. A light from heaven flashed around him. Now, he was, it was during the day, so the sun was out. And so, if you can imagine a light flashing so bright that the sun became meaningless, uh, that was the power of the light. That was, that was how dramatic and extraordinary was the situation. And so, it flashed around him. I, I imagine it being like a clap, like, you know, when, a, when lightning hits really close to you and it just, it just claps right on you. That's what I imagine it being like. Like he's going along, he thinks he's so right, he's pursuing Christians in Damascus, he's, he's honing in, he's getting close to the place, and in the midst of him going so hard in this one direction, something stops him and stops him in his tracks. And so there's a light, and the way I imagine it is that 
that the presence of the Lord, which he saw, we know in other scriptures, he actually saw the presence of God and he heard what the, the Lord was saying. I, I imagine it being like his feet came out from under him and he fell on his face. He and the men that he was with. That's the way I imagine it happening. And so this light flashed around him and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now, what we're about to read lets us know that when Saul had this encounter and he caught a glimpse of God and he became blind from the light and from the presence of seeing a holy God with such unholy eyes and he fell to the ground and he heard this voice, he instantly understood that it was God. He instantly understood that it had a divine quality to it. He instantly understood that in the midst of doing whatever it is I'm doing, uh, something more powerful than me, more powerful than the chief priests, more powerful than the high priests, more powerful than whatever I believe that I'm so sure is so right, more powerful than whatever, wherever I'm getting this dark energy to pursue, pursue these guys, has instantly stopped me in my tracks, knocked me on my face, and is telling me I'm wrong about something, and I know whoever I'm talking to is not the devil, but this force, this power is God. He instantly, he instantly knew that. There was no doubt in his mind. And we can tell that from his response. In verse 3, he responds, Who are you, Lord? And, and I love that the, that the interpreters, the writers, the translators, whoever it was, I love that they write Lord with a capital L. That shows us that he believed that the voice was of divine quality and was God. The Lord, the Messiah, someone. He understood that much, but he did not understand exactly who they were. Now, it's Jesus speaking to him, and he's caught a glimpse of Jesus. And I bet he's even heard Jesus in the past, and so you would think he would be somewhat familiar with Jesus. But this is Jesus high and lifted up in his exalted status. And so the Jesus he knew on earth was still there, but he had re received this exalted state. Uh, you got to remember in Revelation where it, where it describes Jesus in his exalted state, it was quite an awesome sight. It wasn't the Jesus that, that John even remembered. And Jesus had to say, hey, it's me, and he even had to lift him up. So he most certainly had to do it uh, with Saul as well. And so he said, who are you, Lord? Who are you, divine one? Who are you, God? Uh, tell me specifically, who are you? Because i got to understand what I'm doing wrong. And he said, and this had to haunt him. This had to terrify him to the core. He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Immediately, immediately, he knew everything he thought, everything that he was so sure of was absolutely wrong. Now get up, I love this about the Lord, he's such a, he's so soft with people when they come to faith, you know? He said, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. So he was haunted. He, now, now this is important, I think theologically we can extract some things that are very important about soteriology. Soteriology means salvation theology and our understanding of salvation theology, we cannot base um, what we know about people coming to faith on our experience, we have to base it. Our experience may be real, but we have to interpret that experience through the lens of Scripture. And, and what this shows me, and this is going to be a little provocative for some of you, but what this shows me is that salvation is God's idea. And when he wants what he wants, he gets what he wants, it seems to me. Um, at a minimum, what this demonstrates to me is that salvation never seems to come out of the will of man. It comes out of the will of God. And if there is a role for man in salvation, if there is a role for man in salvation in responding to the words and the leadership and the drawing in of God, then it is simply this. Uh, if we have any freedom in that, and by the way, what I'm saying uh, doesn't put me in one theological camp or the other. I'm really good at straddling the fence on important theological issues so that I'm never wrong. Um, 
But, at a, but what I would say, the only question, the only question, let's put it this way, the only question about our conversion as far as it comes out of our will is do we have the capacity to resist the grace of God or not? Is it resistible or is it irresistible? So John Calvin would have said that the grace of God is irresistible. Five-point Calvinism, the grace of God is irresistible. When God comes, he is so powerful, he, he is so wooing, he is so clear, he is so, and he would probably even cite this passage as, as evidence of what he believes. He would say that, it, that it is, he is absolutely irresistible, and, and, and therefore we should believe in predestination because everybody he wanted, he got. I don't, I don't necessarily believe that's true. Um, I believe that's almost true. John Wesley would have said, um, you know what, that's almost true. And, and if somebody would have came to Wesley and said, is the grace of God, um, is it irresistible? Wesley would have said, uh, almost. And, and believe it or not, in, in, in all of what we would consider solid orthodox soteriology, salvation theology, that's the gap. Nobody would argue, John Wesley or John Calvin or anybody in those camps, none of us, any of us would ever argue um, that it's about us. It, it, it was the desire of God for us. The Bible says that the, that, that the Father and the Son were sitting in heaven. They looked down on earth at the sons of men, uh, uh, men and women, and, and, they, and they wanted to see, is there anyone who even seeks us? And there was no one. Is there anyone who teaches on our behalf? There's no one. Is there anyone even looking up and lifting up their head to even know whether we exist? There was no one. And the Bible says that they were appalled, so they themselves decided to work salvation for themselves. And so what I would tell you with a, great sub, with a great amount of scripture to have my back is that if you're here pursuing God, it's because he first pursued you. If you love God, it's because he loves you. If you're seeking God, it's because he first sought you. Salvation is never your idea. It is his idea. If you are feeling wooed by God uh, and, and, and you feel like you're showing some love back in the other direction, it's because it all first emanated with him. Therefore, none of us can boast. It was, it was his idea, it was his great power, it was his great energy. Uh, last week when we talked about the Ethiopian eunuch, we saw God himself, an angel of the Lord from the presence of God, and God himself by the Holy Spirit speaking to Philip. And what was he doing? He was, he was perfectly, personally orchestrating, choreographing the salvation experience of the Ethiopian. He had gone ahead of Philip, his servant, by the power of the Holy Spirit to begin to woo the eunuch. He had shown up to the eunuch and begun to speak to him through the book of Isaiah that somehow landed in his hands. And then he sent his Phil, uh, servant, Philip, to go and to preach and to teach. And it was the presence of God and the will of God and the great desire of God that landed upon that man. And, and, and he did not resist. And he received the great move of God and, on his behalf. And so for, for Saul, for for the 12 you know, disciples, for you and I, for anyone who has a relationship with God, we have simply responded to the great move of God on our behalf. In case you wanted to know, that was really important. So who are you? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They didn't know what was going on. Their, their encounter was less powerful than the encounter uh, that Saul had right among them, uh, but they had a powerful encounter that they couldn't explain either. Um, they were traveling with Saul. They stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but not, did not see anyone. They didn't see, they didn't get a glimpse of the Lord the way uh, Saul did. They also, though they heard something, they did not hear the voice of God. We have other scriptures later in the Bible that make this clear. Uh, they heard something like thunder. They heard uh, there, was, there was the light, there was the power, there was the falling down that they all fell down. There was thunder, there was, there was Saul talking to God, even though they couldn't even hear the other side of the conversation. There was the fact that Saul went blind. They knew that to be a fact, and he had something like scales that grew over his eyes. All of this they witnessed and they could testify to, which is great evidence that God moved in this moment historically and otherwise, but they didn't have the full experience. 
It says Saul got up from the ground. Eventually he was able to raise himself, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. There were scales on his eyes. So they led him by hand into Damascus. And it says for three days he was blind. And for three days he did not eat or drink anything. For three days he was mortified. For three days he was completely undone. He was stunned. He was in shock. He could not believe what he had just experienced. But I think the thing that really, really troubled him uh, for these three days to the point where he could not eat or drink was him dealing with, with him grappling with how wrong he had been. How wrong have I been? I was so sure that I was so right. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hands, but, but how many of you, before you became a believer in Jesus Christ, literally could not believe how ignorant and naive those little lemmings they call Christians were? How many of you, on a more personal level, have thought you were so right about what you were doing with your life, your own ambition, the own direction you were going. I mean, I have this gift, I have this talent, I have this ability, I have this kind of intellect, I have this much energy, I have these opportunities, everything seems laid out before me, and even with faith in God, I know that I'm supposed to go in this direction, and you haul off in that direction, or you haul off with that belief, or whatever you know, you know, and you're sure you're so right, and you go full speed ahead, only to be knocked down like a line, by a, line, a linebacker named Jesus. And, and, and the guy is sitting there, and he's going, what else am I wrong about? And, and I've never had an experience in my life where I wasn't the smartest guy in the room. I've never been in a situation where somebody could outquote me on Scripture. I have more energy than anyone around me, which is why I'm in this position. I have more intensity. I have more intelligence. I, I, was, I, was, I had enlightenment. I had illumination from some source, and I was so sure I was right. And, and then he was mortified because he was so wrong. I don't, I don't really like to exalt intelligence, but I have to say to you from my reading of Scripture, and if you get into the book of Romans and read Paul's writing, uh, he loved to boast about how he wasn't smart, but he really might be one of the smartest people I've ever read. Aristotle, Socrates, all the great philosophers, Old Testament writers, New Testament writers, he might be one of the smartest people I have ever read. I mean, the guy had intellect, and he had it before this experience, and he had it after, but it had a whole new source in, in the wake of this experience. This was so deconstructing to him that when you begin to read his epistles and all the things that Paul wrote uh, after he became a believer— he loved, I mean, you see it all over his writing, he loved to mock human wisdom and intelligence. <laughs> I mean, he mocked it unceasingly. He would, at times, take his own intellect and crunch it under his own feet. He was determined that his own wisdom, his own worldly wisdom, his own wise intellect would no longer cause him to exalt himself above the wisdom and the truth of God. He said at one point uh, to an audience that he was preaching the gospel to or, or writing a letter about the gospel to, he said, let me tell you something. I made up my mind. I decided out of, out of my own will, out of my own discipline, uh, th that I would not come to you with wise and persuasive words. Because, because if I come to you with wise and persuasive words in a worldly sense, then you might come to faith in Christ because I laid out a clever conversation. Um, but that is insufficient because I do not want your faith in Jesus Christ to, to lie on a human argument. I want your faith in Jesus Christ to lie on the fact that he is powerful and you have encountered him and he has revealed his truth to you and you know that it is true. And therefore he said, I have made up my mind to know nothing among you, to know absolutely nothing, even though I'm smart, even though these books that I could read really tickle my mind, even though I could exalt myself with all this intelligence among people, even though like 
academics and intelligence is like a drug to me. Uh, I have made up my mind to throw all of that down and to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. And let me tell you why. He hit me on the, in the nose on the Damascus Road and he showed me that no matter how smart I was, if I don't know him, I am dumb and I am wrong. Now, if that is true theologically, that is true personally in our own experience. There are so many times in my life I set off in a direction. I was so sure that I was right. The right person at the right place at the right time with the right vision, selfish or unselfish, whatever the case may be. But you know what? I can, apart from Christ, I can do nothing. And I, and I have to just empty myself of my own will, and I know you do too, in order to gain the will of God and to have true wisdom which comes from him. Paul one time said uh, he destroys the wisdom of the wise, and he was quoting the Old Testament, and in the intelligence of the intelligence, he frustrates. And so I submit to you today that every single one of us needs to have a time or times or a season where we stop whether we're a believer and this, happen, uh, this happens for the 10th time or we're not a believer and it's happening for the first time, every once in a while we need a gut check. We need to stop. We need a come to Jesus moment. We need a Damascus road experience where we really question everything that we have thought and we take every thought and hold it captive and anything that exalts itself above the word, the wisdom, or the will of God, we crush it under our feet no matter how smart it may seem. And that's a very difficult and terrible thing to have to do, but it is one of the perils that we have to go through to inherit the kingdom of God on earth even before we get to heaven. Aren't y'all glad you came today? This is fun. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord said to him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street, which is a road, a major thoroughfare, still in Damascus to this day, and asked for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For he is praying, and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming and place his hands on him to restore his sight. The ministry for Paul's conversion was not done yet. Uh, Saul still needed an encounter um, with with a preacher of the gospel to make it clear. Somebody had to come and inform his experience and fill in the gaps and lead him and the right thing to do. And so as uh, Saul is sitting there um, haunted for three days, he has a sense from God that somebody's going to come and that he is to trust them and he is to submit to them and he is to listen to them. Uh, The problem was Paul's reputation preceded him and Ananias wasn't so sure. In verse 13, Lord Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. This is a dangerous, dangerous character. And he has come here with the authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. Uh, Ananias, though he is hearing from the Lord about what he is to do and about what the Lord has done with this man, is still left in disbelief. Now, you would think the encounter of talking to God would turn you around pretty quickly. But the reputation was so bad and the implications of being wrong was so dangerous that he paused, he stopped a minute. He didn't really question uh, God probably for the purpose of saying you don't know what you're talking about. He probably questioned God as many of us do, which is a wise thing to say, am I really hearing from you or am I hearing something else or am I walking into a trap? And so he tested it a little bit. Uh, To me, the most powerful part of this section, for those of us who are in ministry, for those of us who love Jesus, for those of us who are called uh, to evangelism, for those of us who work for God and our job is to shepherd people for the Lord, whether it be to lead them for the first time to believe that Christ is their Savior and to learn what it means to be their Lord, whether we have Christians among us as as a pastor, my job is not simply to reach those who are not in a relationship with God and bring them into a relationship with God. It is to see you prosper in your relationship with God, and it is to believe that you, though you are stubborn like I am and self-willed like I am and unrighteous like I am, and by the way, I'm called to this because I'm much more like you than him, um, that I have to believe that God will use me through his spirit and many other circumstances around us to get us to a place where, that we will know and do his will. And, and, I, and I think sometimes that we need to remember what 
Paul said and what Paul thought and Paul's experience so that we have the confidence and we have the boldness to do the work that God has called us to do. And some of us have lost, lost total faith that our husband or wife who isn't a believer will ever become a believer because we look at them and we say they are so stubborn and they are so hard-hearted and they are so set in their ways and they are so sure they're right that they're never going to turn around. But I remind you, as we see from the scripture, they could be no more stubborn and no more self-righteous than the Apostle Paul. It's more about the will of God than it is about the will of man. I'm tempted sometimes to think, man, I am never going to have an obedient church. I mean, they're never going to get it. They're never going to trust me. They're never going to trust the word of God. They're going to give him a little bit. They're not going to give him everything. They're not going to surrender everything. I mean, I'm tempted to think, and by the way, based on personal experience and looking in the mirror, that we're never going to really get it. But even that, even the ability to to know and do the will of God as we become born-again believers and to grow incrementally uh, into his likeness, even that is something that comes out of his strong will. And so this gives me great boldness and this gives me great freedom. I realize all I got to do is stand here and tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Tell it in love. Let it lay out there and trust and entrust you to God and know that he will do the work in you the same way he has done it in me. No sin is is existent among us except that which is common to man. No stubbornness, nothing we're prone to do to be ungodly is extraordinary in the grand scheme of things. What is extraordinary is the grace of God. And so if he can make me a believer, he can make you a believer. If he can make me fall in love with you, he can make, you know, you fall in love with him. If he can teach me to grow increasingly surrendered to him, then he can teach you to grow increasingly surrendered to him. Uh, The ball is in his court. He is the mighty and powerful one. All we have to do when we get to that moment, our only responsibility is to say yes, Lord, and to not resist. So the Lord said to Ananias, but the Lord said to Ananias, go, I love that he, go, he yelled it, so I got to yell it. In case you were wondering, I wasn't yelling before, I just yelled then. Go, he was, you could see a little frustration. This man is my chosen instrument. I'm going to do what I'm going to do with who I'm going to do it with. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. It's decreed. And some would say he decreed it because he can do any, whatever he wants with whoever he wants, whenever he wants it. Some would say it's decreed because he knew in advance how Paul would respond. Again, that's the theological, you know, the question, is it resistible or irresistible? Regardless, he wasn't going to resist it, and the power of God was going to get it done. And he proclaimed uh, that this guy was his instrument. Uh, basically, he's saying, Uh, All that energy, all that intensity, all that intellect that was going this way, well, guess what? I'm going to redeem it. I'm going to actually use it, and then I'm going to reverse it. And instead of being an instrument against me to persecute me, he's going to be an instrument in my hand to do whatever I will him to do. That's awesome, isn't it? Did you know, and I am sure that I'm right about this, and when, if you think I'm wrong, when you get to heaven, you can ask God. If you don't go to heaven, then you can't ask anybody. But I'm pretty sure this is true, that this has been said over every single one of us who comes to faith in him. It says, it's as if the Lord is speaking to the devil who accuses us day and night, and he's saying he can't be your servant, and he can't be your pastor, and she can't serve you, and they can't, they're so wrong you can't redeem them. And he yells back, and he says, let me tell you something. This man or this woman is my chosen instrument. It is said over every single one of us. Now, we may not have as dramatic an encounter with God, as an extraordinary encounter with God, all at one moment the way Paul did, but incrementally through time, our experiences add up to the point where we have an encounter with God just like this. He may have done it over time, but we get to this place either quickly or, or, or over a period of time. We get to this place, and there is a calling, and there is a purpose, and there is a declaration. And and so you can imagine today, you're going your own way, you're doing your own thing, you're walking far from the will of God, even as a believer perhaps. 
And the Lord intercedes in time and space, and he says, let me tell you something. Let me declare to the heavens and to the earth something. I made this person. I'm going to use this person. They're going to submit to me. They're going to put my, their life in my hand. I'm going to redignify them. I'm going to redeem their experiences, and I'm going to use them. They are my chosen instrument. I decree it. And everybody can say everything they want to say about how hard-headed they are. And everybody can say everything they want to say about how stubborn and disobedient they are. And everybody can say whatever they want about how sinful and unusable they are. And everybody can say everything they want about how this person doesn't have the intellect or the abilities or the gifts or the talents to do anything extraordinary for God. It doesn't matter. When they submit to me and they become an instrument in my hand, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Man, I love the fact that God is in control. In verse 18, now this seems vindictive, but I have a different interpretation on it. The Lord says to Ananias, and the way I've always read this is letting Ananias know that he was going to get him back. He says, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And the way I always read that is, you know, this guy caused a lot of suffering and, and there was going to be retribution. He was going to pay with a lot of suffering. But the way I read it now is, no, uh, it, he has had so much revealed to him about the grace of God that he will willingly submit to whatever suffering is required uh, to glorify God and to inherit eternal life. That's the way I read it. Uh, Jesus once said, those who are forgiven much, love much. And another time he said, those who love me, obey me. So we can, you know, we can do all the math on that. And we can say those who are forgiven much, love much, and obey much, and are willing to suffer much. I believe uh, the evidence that we see grace for what it is and what we have received by the love of God because of his intervention in our life causes us to be more willing to be obedient, even to the point of suffering, causes us more willing to surrender our life to him and our own dreams to him rather than having the dreams we want to have for ourselves. A clear understanding of how much we've been saved, how much we've been loved, how doomed we were eternally in hell, you could say, and we've been redeemed for that for everlasting bliss in the presence of God. The clearer that is to us, the more we're willing to say, hey, these next few years that I have on earth, do as you will. Even at the cost of everything that I dreamed about, even at the cost of my own physical well-being, I'm willing to suffer much. Of course, we understand that when Jesus said those who are forgiven much, love much, what he meant is that we were all forgiven much and we should all love much. And when he says that, he's basically saying, you know, there are some of you who have lived so compliant and put all your ducks in a row and you seem to have all your stuff together. And so when grace comes into your life, it's just a small little thing, a little tiny response. Let me, you know, put a little icing on the cake. Therefore, we don't think that we've been forgiven much. Therefore, we don't love much and therefore we don't obey much. But if we truly had the scales fall off of our eyes and see what God has done for us in an eternal sense, we would realize that we have all been forgiven much and that we have all got a responsibility to love much and to obey much as well. So Ananias went. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. He placed his hands on Saul and he said, Brother Saul, immediate reconciliation. Isn't that amazing the way God can work grace in our hearts? He had every reason to hate him, every reason to say you need to repent, every reason to be reluctant, but immediately he received him as a brother. It seems even enthusiastically. You know why? Because when God has forgiven your sins and he's forgiven their sins, then there's no reason we shouldn't forgive the sins that we have with one another. And Jesus was very clear about that. So with grace and forgiveness, he called him brother, brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so he filled, in, uh, he filled in the blanks. And we know from other scripture that he even taught him a little bit more. And he made it very, very clear to him. He, was, he brought the gospel or finished the gospel revelation uh, that, that Saul had. The Bible says that immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. 
He got up and he was baptized. He still was required to confess his faith in God. He was still required, as we all are, to surrender to God and to submit to the sacrament of baptism. He did all the things that everybody does just because he had this extraordinary you know, encounter with God and had this extraordinary calling. Even Jesus submitted himself to baptism and so, and so did Paul. He is saved the same way we're all saved, by grace, through faith, in confession, through baptism, and entirely surrendering our lives to him. After taking some food, he regained his strength. I think when the scales fell from his eyes, I think he went from this place of going, I have been so wrong about everything for so long, I don't know what to believe anymore. And I think immediately when the scales fell from his eyes, all that, all that intellect and all that he knew was redeemed. It was plugged into God. And what was right became righteous. I think immediately when the scales fell from his eyes, not only could he physically see, I think he could spiritually see. And I think he saw for the very first time this Messiah that I seem to know so much about. Well, I just met him on the road. The Messiah is Jesus. And now not only do I understand the second glorious coming, I understand the first coming when he came humble as a servant to die on the cross for our sins. I believe that he, was, that he died and that he was buried, that he was resurrected, that he ascended into heaven, and one day he will come again. And, and I understood that one, but I understand the whole, thing now I think he instantly understood that the law that he had memorized and tried so hard to keep was not there to earn him righteousness but was there to show them show him and everyone that they couldn't be righteous to quantify their unrighteousness so that he might see and they might see that not only do they need a messiah to save them from the world they need a messiah to save them from themselves And so instantly he understood the Messiah and what it really meant. Instantly he understood the law that he was an expert in and what it really meant. And instantly he understood the temple and the temple sacrifices and what it really meant. What he understood was this isn't about any kind of merit I have in offering anything to God. This blood sacrifice of animals was simply the foreshadowing of Jesus Christ giving his blood on our behalf on the cross. We gave those sacrifices to remind God in heaven that eventually Jesus would get this sacrifice and And that grace that he earned there would be, you know, given to us on credit way back here. Instantly, everything that he understood, everything he knew was redeemed. And it was made valuable. The scales fell from his eyes and he could see into God's word and not just memorize it or have some kind of external understanding with it. It was written in his heart. The same way it is for each of us. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, And we see it was the will of God that saved me, and I simply responded. I cannot be self-righteous. I cannot earn righteousness. I cannot make enough offerings to give myself a right relationship with God. He had to do it for me on the cross. He had to die for my sins. I think we're tempted today to look at a story like this and say this was one extraordinary guy at one extraordinary time with one extraordinary calling. And it's easy for, our, uh, for us to dismiss ourselves and say, I, I don't need to have such an encounter as Paul did because he was such a worse guy than me and he had so much more to do than me. But you know what? I think that is absurd. I think we're supposed to read this and read ourselves into it. God is no respecter of men. He, res- he, he exalts no man over another man for the purpose of, of self-vanity or self-glorification. He gives people authority, but that has nothing to do with seeing anyone greater than anyone else. There's no sin except that which is common to man. There is no calling except that which goes upon all of humanity. If we can't read ourselves in this, then we're totally missing the point. Just like Paul, we were formed in the mind of God before we ever existed in the womb of our mother. The Bible says that we were knit together in the womb of our mother, that the Lord intently put us there. He created us purposely. He is the author of our life. He's the author of our salvation. And he put us there and and he knew the right person in the right place and at the right time. And he gave us a personality and he gave us certain gifts and talents and abilities. And he made us just who he wanted us to be, to, to be what he has called us to be. And he knit us together, and and the Bible says not only that, he ordained our days, and before a single one of them came to be, he wrote about them all. He allowed our our, our pre-regenerate life, he allowed our life apart from him, and and, and he's going to take that, just like he did with Paul, and he's going to redeem it, and he's going to reverse it. 
He allowed it and then he will redeem it and then he's going to reverse it and then he's going to use it and then he's going to take us up as an instrument in his hand as we surrender to him and do something through us that he has never done before. It may look a lot like what he did with somebody over here and it may look a lot like what he did with somebody over there in our own judgment. It might be a lot lower than what he did over here, but it doesn't matter. We're an instrument in the hand of God for his will. And if we read this any other way, if we do not read ourselves into this, then this, is, then this is foolishness. And our encounter with God and what we're doing here in this church is absolute rubbish if we can't apply these scriptures to ourselves, We have been forgiven much, therefore we should love much. And if we love much, we should obey much. And if we obey much, we should be willing to suffer much. And maybe God will give us a great life on earth, but one thing we know is he's going to give us a great life in heaven. And with that knowledge, if we really believe that, then we shouldn't care so much about what happens in the next 24 hours. We're going to close with a song. It's called Mighty to Save. Everybody loves the song Mighty to Save. I love the song Mighty to Save because what it says to us, if God be for us, then who can be against us? But I almost think that we've looked at the lyrics of the song the wrong way. We've looked at the ser- lyrics of the song in a very self-centered way rather than a God-centered way. And so as we sing these lyrics today, let us look at it in a God-centered way. When we sing Mighty to Save, Mighty to Save, Let us celebrate and interpret those lyrics as a prayer back to God saying, Lord, you are mighty to save even the hardest of hearts. Even those with the strongest will and the hardest of hearts and the most selfish and self-centered among us, you are mighty to save even the most despised among us, including me. You're mighty, mighty to save, to bring illumination, to bring truth into the hardest of hearts, to the most intellectual, sinister, unbelieving person. You can flip their mind in a, in a moment's time. You are mighty to reverse the most strong-willed child and flip them around and send them in the, in the right direction. You did it with me. You did it with Paul. You're doing it all over this church. You are mighty to save. You are mighty to redeem. You are mighty to reverse. You are mighty to change. And when we sing the part about he can move the mountains, instead of today, at least this particular time when we sing it, let us interpret that a little differently as well. Instead of exalting him for his ability to move mountains as if he's going to move mountains on our behalf to make our life easier, maybe what we should sing is, you can move the mountain not for me, you can move the mountain that is me. Uh, you, can, you can move me out of a way. Uh, I've been an impediment to you. I've been an impediment to your will in my life. I've been in, an impediment to those around me who I'm called to reach and to believe. I am the mountain. Forget moving a mountain for me. Forget working in my circumstances. Work in me. Instead of letting me treat you like an instrument that I can put in my hand to do what I will, uh, I surrender myself and I put myself in your hand to do your will. You are mighty to save me. You are mighty to change my heart. You are mighty to work in me, to will and act according to your good purposes. You You can move mountains. You can move this big, fat, stubborn mountain. And you can melt me down and you can make me pliable in your hand. You can turn me from a goat into a sheep who knows your voice, who loves your voice, and who will follow you. You you can do anything. You can even change this. Maybe that's the miracle we need today. Maybe we came to church because we needed God to do something for us. And I have good news. The Bible says if we seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness to be an instrument in his hand, then he says he'll take care of all of that in his time and his way eventually as well. So that good news is there. His care and his concern uh, are beyond impeachment. But maybe today we say the prayer and we sing the song a little different way. Maybe today we entirely surrender our lives into his hands. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you come to us in our greatest time of need. You come to us uh, in our greatest time of need. And what I mean by that, Lord, you come to us in our greatest time of need, which is that time we don't even know we need you. When we think that we're prospering in our ways, when we think we're going down this road and everything is perfect and everything is great. 
You come to us in our time of need when we think we are so, so right, but we are so, so wrong. You come to us when we are so self-righteous and so strong and you meet us along the road and you stop everything and you do it out of your amazing grace and your amazing love. You do not allow us to prosper in any way that causes us to stray from you. You are good and you are mighty and you are strong to save. Thank you and praise you that you are a father who so loves his strong-willed children that you will intervene in our life and not allow us and not hand us over to our own devices, but reverse and change everything. Lord, I lift up this congregation to you today that includes me. I pray that you would soften every heart, that you would do this great work in our heart, that you would soften us, that you would cause us to submit to you, to surrender to you, that we would see that we are greatly loved that we have been greatly forgiven and give us the capacity to greatly obey. It's in your holy name and for your glory we pray. Amen.